Okay, well, let me just read for you the three verses. And again, the text that we've been looking at as we've been going through the service are really the text that we're going to look a little bit more carefully at uh, in the message. But this is one of them. And this is um, really under the second point. Uh, what does the fall of man and total depravity result in? Okay, well, this is what Paul tells us about in Romans 8, verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> he says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, I'm going to go into this a little bit more detail, but to be in the flesh is, is the condition we come into in this world. To be in the Spirit is to have the Spirit of God in your heart in a saving way. It's to be a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, if you don't have the Spirit of God in your heart, you're in the flesh. And if you're in the flesh, you cannot please God. So this is the answer to the Enlightenment thinkers right here, isn't it, uh, as far as what the Bible says? <coughs> Regarding our condition, can we make life better on earth um, in the condition in which we are? No, but we can sure mess things up, and that's what we see going on in the world throughout the history of mankind. Okay. Well, as I've said, tonight we're going to be looking at the Enlightenment, um, uh, this idea that, wow, well, this, this new burst of light, uh, now we see things the way we should see them, which really uh, we would say is not the Enlightenment, but rather it was, the, as Gerster called it, the endarkenment, if we can put it that way, the endarkenment or something of that nature. But this is a movement that uh, began in the late 16th, excuse me, 17th century, so 1600s, and continued through the 18th. Now, Dr. Godfrey tonight is going to characterize it as the attempt to find a principle that would unite society as a whole. Um, and the reason being is the one that did unite it was destroyed, and it was destroyed by the Reformation, which is one of the causes of the uh, Enlightenment, which we're going to look at in just a moment. Now, the principle that they decided on that would unite society was that man isn't that bad after all. Man is essentially good. And because he is, the only thing that's necessary to make life better in this world are just some tweaks in the church and in government. Life could be much better than, on earth than it, than it is now, um, they believed. And so they began to have a very optimistic view that things could get better if we could just adjust certain things. Now, the Enlightenment had three main causes. The first was the Renaissance. You know, it's interesting, the Renaissance is what brought about the Reformation because the Renaissance is when, you know, the, uh, the, the, well, the persecution by the Turks in the East brought the Christian scholars with their manuscripts, their New Testament manuscripts to the West and uh, the publishing of a Greek New Testament by Erasmus and Luther's reading it is what brought about the Reformation. But it also brought about some other things, okay? The, Re the Renaissance was a movement that, that really allowed Europeans to rediscover Greek and Roman culture. And as they did, they, they saw their emphasis on the here and now, that, that life could be better here and now, could be enjoyed rather than the world to come. So this is one of the things that feeds into the Enlightenment. The second one was the Reformation. Now, of course, when we think about that movement, when we think about the Reformation, what immediately comes to mind, of course, is the work of Martin Luther and the rediscovery of the biblical gospel. Sometimes we forget, you know, that it had another effect, and, and that effect was to destroy the monopoly that the Roman church had, its monolithic power. They are what before served to cement society, and now that cement was broken. By the way, the Roman church was also uh, being seen as a hindrance to scientific in inquiry or pursuits. You know, we only need to think of Galileo and the church's reaction to him when he tried to convince them to look through his telescope to see for themselves what Copernicus said was true, that the earth is not the center of our solar system, 
but the sun is. So again, the idea that they were wrong and it broke their monolithic grip on science. And then, of course, the, something that goes along with it was the scientific method, or what's called the analytical method. And I think it's something that um, kind of came to the front through the discovery of a Christian scientist by the name of Isaac Newton who um, discovered gravity. And uh, there became more and more optimism that uh, we can discover more through empiricism, through our senses, than through reason. So the scientific method is where researchers collect data through experimentation, through observation, and then they analyze all that data to try to find a pattern or some logic to this data. So in doing this, though, it shifted science away from a more rationalistic way of dealing with things, the belief that reason, not experience, is the foundation of certainty, and well, there's a lot that could be said about that, to empiricism. You know, the truth can only be discovered through um, the, the senses, through experience, through observation. You know, one only needs to think of Immanuel Kant, where he relegated God and essences and everything that you can't see with the senses, you can't perceive, you know, with, with uh, again, the, the senses into a realm where you, you can't discover it. So God became irrelevant. And what became relevant was what I could see, what I could hear, what I could touch and taste and so forth. According to Carl Becker, an American historian of the early, early 20th century, and we're going to hear about this tonight, the Enlightenment's basic principles were, were these, that man is not born depraved, but virtuous. That the goal of life is, is not the, the life hereafter, but rather to have a good life here on this earth. That man is able, guided only by his reason and experience, to perfect this good life on earth, to create a utopia. By the way, does that sound familiar, utopia? Who, which um, political philosopher uh, believed that we could have utopia if we only had no government and everybody shared everything equally? See, Karl Marx is actually a son of the Enlightenment. And then Karl Becker goes on to say that what was necessary for this good life on earth was the freeing of men's minds from superstition, that is, from the dogma of the church, and their bodies from the oppression of government. Now, both Godfrey and Sproul agree that the entire system, which continues very strongly to influence the world today, was built on one premise, and that is that man is basically good. I hope you can see that, that if that weren't true, then, then nothing of what they've just said or believed could possibly help, right? They believe man was good. This morning, what we want to do is test that theory by the light of scripture and reason to see if they are in fact right. So the question, first of all, is what does God tell us in his word? Well, he tells us, as we've already seen, that man is spiritually dead. And what that means is that he is morally depraved. There is no goodness in man as he comes into this world. That means that you and I were born into this world dead in sin morally unable to do anything pleasing to God. Now again, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, that first part that we don't like to hear, but we do like the second part that talks about God's mercy. But this is our condition as we came into the world. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, I want you to notice that Paul begins by saying, you, you know, you Ephesians were dead. And then he switches to among them, we too, he includes himself. This is true of, of everyone. Now, when Paul says we were dead in trespass and sin, he doesn't mean that we were dead in every sense of the word dead. Obviously, we weren't dead physically before we came to Christ. 
What he's talking about here is that we were dead in a spiritual sense. Uh, he tells us in the book of Romans that Adam's sin killed us, Romans 5 verse 12. Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now what he's saying here is that when Adam sinned, we all sinned. We all sinned in Adam because he represented us in the garden. And because he represented us, his sin has killed all of us. We have all died. Now, his sin killed us in three senses. It did kill us physically. Remember what God said to Adam? In the day that you eat from it, the tree, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Now, we know that Adam didn't drop dead as soon as he ate of that tree, but we do know that the process of death started in his body. The seeds of physical death were sown. He began to age, and he would eventually die. That's why we grow old and why we will eventually die. Adam's sin killed us not only physically but judicially. It brought us under the sentence of condemnation and death. We're, we're guilty in God's court of law. And if we die in this condition, we will go down into eternal death, which is hell forever. But for our point this morning, it also killed us spiritually. Remember how God made man originally? He made him good. And man had a good disposition. He had what we call original righteousness, which is simply a theological term to say that he loved what was good. You know, his heart wanted what was right, and so he made good choices. But the fall took that away. We lost that in the fall. That's the reason why he hid from God. That's why he was trying to cover himself up. It's the reason why he was cast out of paradise is because of his sin. Now, we lost that love because of him. We're spiritually dead, and that means we no longer love what is good, but now we love what is evil. And that's why Paul tells us in our text that as we come into this world, we live like the rest of the world. Why we followed the devil's example of rebellion. You know, we walk according to the prince of the power of the air. What did he do? Well, he rebelled against God. And we do the same thing from the time we can make choices. Actually, we come into the world even when we're born, even before we're born, with a heart that is indisposed toward God. We do not love him. So we lived in, Paul says, we indulged the lusts of the flesh and of the mind, and we were the children of wrath which means that we were born under God's wrath and would face that wrath if things didn't change. Now, Paul tells us that being in this condition, we could not do anything that is pleasing to God. That's what Romans 8, verses 6 through 8 tells us. Let me read it again. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Notice hostility, because we won't submit to him. We can't submit to him. That's what Paul is saying. And since we can't, well, then we cannot please him. And again, I just remind you that to have a mind that's set on the flesh means that we're in the flesh. If we have the Spirit, then we're in the Spirit, and we have our minds set on the Spirit. Uh, that's what God does in the new birth. You know, he says in verse 9, Paul says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If the Spirit of God dwells in us, if we're in the Spirit, our minds will be set on the things of the Spirit, which means we will focus on the Word of God, and we will follow what it says, we'll follow his leading, we'll obey because that's what we want to do. But if we're in the flesh, our minds will be set on the things of the flesh, which means we'll focus on the world and we'll follow the prince of this world. We'll be hostile toward God, refusing to submit to him because you can't really submit to what your heart resists. You have to be willing, right? And you're not willing if you're in the flesh. And being unable to submit to that, to his law, well, how can we please him? 
Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, if you hate him, you won't. And that's what Paul is saying is we hate him and so we won't. And that shows we don't love him and that's not pleasing to God. Again, Paul's conclusion is those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And more importantly, that means that we won't, in this condition, be able to come to Christ because it would be very pleasing to God if we actually did repent and turn to Him and trust, but we cannot do that as long as we are in the flesh. Now, that's what Jesus said to the crowd that was following Him in John chapter 6, and I tend to think a lot of people miss this when they read it. He says in verse 65, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. And he says in verse 44, that same chapter, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Isn't it interesting that Jesus' evangelistic message to the crowd of Jews that were following him is, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. I, I don't know when the last time you heard an evangelist say that. Some do, but very few. John Gerstner was a strong advocate of, of that. Yeah, I don't think we have to say that all the time, but we do have to realize that our audience cannot do what the gospel is calling them to do. When Jesus says no one can come to him, remember, he's not talking about permission. He's not saying no one may come to me unless the Father draws him. He's talking about ability. No one is able to. Same thing Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 6. We cannot please God. We're not able to submit to God because we hate God and we hate His law. See, God is not the one stopping those people from coming, Jesus is saying. It's just that nobody wants to come because they hate God. Now, the only way they can want to come, Jesus says, is if the Father grants it, if the Father draws. And here's an interesting point. The word draw here is not to woo or to convince, you know, to have such a powerful argument that it, you know, convinces that person to come to Christ. The word literally means to drag by force, okay? That's interesting, isn't it? Now, this, let me give you the, you know, almost every use of the word in the New Testament because it's not used that many times, but this is the word used in John 18.10 for uh, the event where Peter draws his, his sword to attack the high priest, and he ends up cutting off the ear of the servant of the high priest. But in order to get that sword to the point where he could strike, he had to pull it out, okay? So it's the idea of drawing it out with, with force, you know? He didn't try to convince the sword to come out of its scabbard, you know? He grabbed a hold of it and yanked it out, right? It's the same word used in John 21, 6 to refer to the disciples when they tried to get the nets full of fish into the boat. They hauled in the net. Again, not trying to convince the net to come in, but they dragged it in, hauled it in. Luke uses this word to refer to Paul and Silas as being dragged before the authorities against their will. Paul being dragged out of the temple after being accused of bringing some Gentiles into the temple. And James, James uses it to speak of how the rich drag the poor um, before the courts in order to accuse them. Jesus here is saying that no one can come to Jesus, no one can come to him unless the Father drags them, unless he compels them. Now, we're going to see in just a few moments what this compulsion or this dragging is. It's not against a person's will, but it is, again, force that is applied by the Lord to bring that person savingly to Christ. But the point is this, left to ourselves, we would never come to Christ because we're in the flesh, because our minds are set on the flesh, because we're hostile toward God, we hate Him, because we will not submit to His law. And that's because we're spiritually dead. Now, Jonathan Edwards, and boy, you know, he, he wrote a very large section dealing with this. I'm just going to give his summary. But he notes in his book called The Doctrine of Original Sin Def Defended, okay? And by the way, we need to ask the question, why was he defending that doctrine? It's because people were denying it, okay? Jonathan Edwards lived during the time of the Enlightenment. He lived in the 18th century. He, he heard what was coming out of Europe. He knew it was 
influencing the colonies. So he writes this book, and he notes in his book that depravity, the total depravity of man can be proven apart from the Scripture using the very method that the Enlightenment thinkers use to find the truth, that is, by using the scientific method, by using observation. Okay, what, and so he asks the question, what do we observe from human history? And th this is his summary. I'm just going to give you uh, one sentence summary. All mankind constantly in all ages without fail in any one instance run into that moral evil which is in effect their own utter and eternal perdition in a total privation of God's favor and suffering of his vengeance and wrath. Notice all mankind, all ages, without fail, in any one instance, they all run into moral evil. Okay, this is what we see when we look at the world. I mean, just ask yourself, what, what do we see now? Well, we see the slaughter of Israeli women and children, and the, the rape of women, uh, the kidnapping of women and children, babies. There, there were some atrocities committed that, that you know, nobody even really wants to talk about by Hamas. We see Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. We see China threatening Taiwan. We see North Korea threatening us and Iran threatening us. You know, there's, there's war going on all the time. And, you know, we're still early in this century. Think about what happened in the last century. You know, what did we see? World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, the Cold War, Six-Day War, Gulf War. The war in Afghanistan, you know, and there, that's just the ones that perhaps we were involved in to some degree, perhaps with the exception perhaps of the Six-Day War, I'm not quite sure. But if man is essentially good, as Enlightenment thinkers believed, okay, why was there a Stalinist Russia? Why was there a Hitler Germany? Why was there a Holocaust? Why has there been warfare and death throughout the entire history of the world? And the answer is because man is not essentially good. Man is essentially evil. Now, if man is as bad as the Bible portrays him, then why is there any good in the world? I, I think we'd all recognize that, that there is a lot of good. We see people doing good things. We see people who aren't Christians doing good things. And we certainly see a lot of um, good gifts given to us we know where they come from. They come from God. Why is that? Well, it's because we know that God has not abandoned the human race, but God is good to all mankind, isn't he? We call it God's common goodness, his common grace. David writes about it in Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all. And his mercies are over all his works. And then we have Jesus telling us in the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. By the way, Jesus' description of his Father is a description that is true of God throughout the history of the world. Sometimes when you read the book of Numbers, you might wonder, what's Jesus talking about here? But we need to remember that the same God who was judging his people because of their, their crimes against him, especially of ingratitude and unbelief, had been extremely merciful and gracious to them and bringing them into the world and taking care of them and redeeming them out of Egypt and keeping his promises to Abraham all the way down the line. God had showed them so much mercy. And that's the reason why when they showed their ungratefulness and lack of trust, why the Lord judged them so severely. And I'm talking about a group of people who didn't know him, okay? They, they knew him in a certain sense and they had a relationship with him a relationship in a certain sense, but they were not born-again believers, the majority of them. There's just a remnant of them 
that were. Well, this goodness is, just, is expressed in various ways. God restrains wickedness in men's hearts. He shows his mercy, his kindness to all mankind because he is good. That's his nature. God gives good gifts to his, his people. They, all mankind are his people in a certain sense, right? But also because he wants to preserve the world as he calls his people out of the world through the gospel. So the reason why we see this goodness is because God is good. And we also see it because God has a purpose. God still has a people that are going to be redeemed. And once they're all redeemed, he is going to take them out. And then he is going to judge all mankind. And then all men will receive what they deserve from the hand of God. We will deserve what Christ, well, we'll get what Christ deserves, thankfully, because of God's grace and mercy. But the rest of the world will get what they have earned through their sins. Now, finally, if man is as bad as God says, then we need to ask the question, how can anyone ever come to Christ? And we've already seen the answer to that question. God has to drag them. He has to compel them. And then the question comes, does that mean that he forces people, that he forced us against our wills into the kingdom of heaven? Well, you know what? I'd be willing to accept that. I mean, I'd, I'd rather he do that to me than let me perish, but that's not what he does, okay? This dragging is simply the result of God's work by his Holy Spirit in our hearts to make us willing to come to Christ. This is what Jesus referred to when he's talking to Nicodemus as being born again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That is the, the dragging. That is the compulsion. We need the new birth. We need the Spirit of God. And what does the Spirit of God do? Well, he becomes within our souls, in our hearts, you know, this new principle of love. Love for God, love for Christ, love for His kingdom, love for His law that fights and overcomes the evil that's within our hearts. So in a certain sense, this new desire, this new love is what drags us and compels us to come. But it's not against our will entirely. The only thing that, that may be against our will is the fact that we still will evil, and it's against that will. But it's according to the new desire it's according to that love that he has put in our hearts for him. So that new desire compels us to come to him. We come because we want to come more than we don't want to come. Whereas before, we didn't want to come at all. Okay, now we want to come more than we don't want to come. That is the Spirit of God working within us. And at the same time, it's reflecting the imperfection that's still in our hearts. So... In conclusion, God tells us that man is not essentially good, but he is evil. He cannot, because he will not, submit to God's law. And because of that, he can't do anything that is good, because God's law is the definition of good. And if he won't submit to that, and he can't submit to it, he's not able to submit to it, he's also unable to do any real good. And that means utopia is never going to come through man's efforts. The only way it's going to come is through the gospel. By the way, that utopia, what is, what is utopia? What is ultimately utopia? The word itself means nowhere, okay, because utopia doesn't exist anywhere. But it did become the word for a perfect society. Well, what is that perfect society? It's the one that Jesus came to bring. It's the kingdom of heaven. That's the perfect society. Uh, at least as perfect as it's going to get in this world, and the eternal kingdom of heaven is the perfect utopia that we long for. But how do we get to that utopia? Well, the only way we can is through the gospel. That's why we need to embrace it. We need to embrace Christ and trust in him alone. And that's also why we need to share the message of the gospel with others, because as we do, the Lord will call his sheep to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He will build his kingdom. And remember, it isn't until the last of his sheep among the Jews and the Gentiles come to faith that utopia is going to come, the eternal kingdom of heaven, the last day, the eternal state, which will go on forever and ever. So what promotes it? What is going to make hasten, so to speak? Remember how the, 
saw last week that the Puritans were trying to hasten the coming of Christ and they were trying to do it by their faithfulness. Well, that's the sense in which faithfulness actually does hasten the coming of Christ. It advances his kingdom in the world and his people here. And they respond by his grace and they come into his kingdom. So if we want to see that they hastened, the only thing we can do is simply be faithful in doing what the Lord has called us to do. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And um, as we pray, let's ask the Lord to help us to be faithful, to thank him for his mercy in having saved us out of the situation we just heard about, giving us his Holy Spirit. And as we also pray, let's pray that he would prepare us to come to the table this morning.